In the third video for SLO7, we'll be discussing how acids and bases influence both the rate and product distributions of reversible additions to carbonyls. So to get started, we'll actually think about an example reaction involving a ketone, cyclohexanone, and an alcohol, in this case ethanol. And what we know from the second video in the series, that we'll, there'll be a reaction where the oxygen acts as a nucleophile, or a nucleophilic site, toward the electrophilic carbonyl, and that will give rise to a hemiacetal product, where the starred carbon here was the electrophilic site. So we're basically able to see the conversion of a carbonyl into a, what we're going to call, hemiacetal. So as you might be able to guess, we have an okay electrophile. Ketones are kind of like in the middle of our series of electrophilic carbonyls, and not a particularly good nucleophile. So one way we could actually make this reaction go faster is by introducing a base. We could use hydroxide. We could use the conjugate base of our, of our solvent slash nucleophile. Those things would all work. So this would be an example of base catalysis. If we use this compound in catalytic amounts, This reaction would be base catalyzed. And we know that that's going to make the reaction go faster because we'll be using a better nucleophile while we're keeping our electrophile the same. So faster reaction. One thing that's really important to note, and this actually came up quite a bit in the third exam, the presence of a catalyst doesn't change the position of equilibrium. This is a critically important concept for both organic chemistry and biochemistry. So we're not going to change KEQ. We're just going to get to equilibrium faster. So really on its face, base catalysis of hemiacetals uh, or, or hemiacetal synthesis isn't all that interesting for us. Uh, these reactions are not particularly fast without the catalyst, but because these reactions are also usually unfavorable, not that critical for us. On the other hand, we could also think about doing the same kind of a reaction, so using cyclohexanone and ethanol, and instead treating this with some kind of an acid catalyst. So I'll just write this as proton cat, right? So this is our very acidic um, cabbie. And here something interesting happens. We actually don't isolate a hemiacetal from the reaction at all. We get an entirely different kind of a product where we actually incorporate two different molecules of ethanol to form a structure that looks like this. So it looks kind of similar to a hemiacetal, and that we're removing the carbonyl from our electrophilic carbon, but rather than having one alcohol and one ether, we have two ethers. So it turns out that this functional group is called an acetal, not an acetal, an acetal. And so now that we have both of these functional groups, maybe the name hemiacetal makes sense. Hemi means half. So it looks like I have half, like one ether, of what an acetal would be, which is two ethers that share a carbon. What's surprising to me here is that even though we're doing acid catalysis and we would expect to accelerate the reaction by actually protonating the carbonyl and making it a better electrophile, here we're actually changing what we're actually making in the reaction entirely, which is a little bit unusual. Right, so one of the things that we can take away from this is that acid catalyzed reactions, I can spell, of alcohols and ketones or aldehydes leads to acetal formation. not a result that we necessarily would have expected. And it's actually kind of unusual generally that the introduction of a catalyst will not only accelerate reactions, but also change the product distribution. So treat this as an exception, not the rule, that catalysts are going to allow us to make different kinds of things. In the next section of this video, what we'll be looking at is both the mechanism of acetal formation, where we'll apply some of the concepts that we've, known, we've uh, established from earlier in the semester, thinking about how catalysts will make better electrophiles as well as better leaving groups. And also we'll look at some examples of, of different kinds of acetals and how we can make them, as well as the fact that even though we're running this reaction, we know that there is a side product that's not listed yet, water, and that this reaction, even though it forms acetals instead of hemiacetals, this process is still reversible.
So we'll start our next section of the video by looking at the mechanism of acid-catalyzed acetal formation, and we'll use the same example compounds, so cyclohexanone, ethanol, and we'll use H+, although you would imagine if you did this reaction in the lab, there's no bottle of H+, that you can use. You use strong acids like sulfuric acid or HCl, those kinds of compounds. So um, the way I want to get it started is by thinking about, well, what would the catalyst do? And I know that acid catalysts make better electrophiles generally. So even though either of these oxygens could be protonated, we're actually going to protonate the carbonyl oxygen first because that's the only thing that's actually productive. Both of those things happen. Sometimes the alcohol gets protonated, but it's reversible. And so we have the uh, situation where the proton that I'm showing here is basically rattling around in multiple equilibria until we get to this, format, this point where we protonate a carbonyl. We know that this is going to be a reversible process. And so we end up with still a CO pi bond, but now an oxygen that's missing a lone pair and is positively charged, the ethanol molecule is unchanged. So in this step, what I've done is made a much better electrophile. So this structure, better E plus. And now even though I've got a relatively weak nucleophile like ethanol, um, we can actually do a nucleophilic addition with the oxygen of the ethanol, break the CO pi bond, that restores neutrality on the oxygen that's positively charged, so this would be a little bit more favorable than in a situation where I was making an O minus, so like the uncatalyzed reaction where there was no proton on the oxygen. So this is going to get me to, if I follow my arrows, an alcohol. So this oxygen is now this one. And I've also got this whole unit, this ethanol molecule that's attached now. The proton is still on the alcohol, and that oxygen is now positively charged. So um, we get to here. This looks a little bit familiar. If you squint at this or you cover the H, this looks a bit like a hemiacetal. And so you can imagine that one of the possibilities here is that this proton just comes off. So this is... A protonated hemiacetal. The hemiacetal does form to some extent, but we're trying to rationalize where we actually get an acetal from. And one of the things that we would observe when we think about the acetal structure is that this carbon here that was a part of the carbonyl needs to have another ether group. So one possibility is that I remove this proton and add an ethyl group which I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work. The other possibility is that I could try to think about breaking the CO single bond, and that would allow me to actually introduce another OET group onto this carbon. So both of those are, are, are general ways that we could end up with the acetal structure. So aside from this proton dissociating to give me the hemiacetal, the other thing that could happen is that this proton could actually be transferred to the other oxygen of the structure. So if we show this as an intramolecular proton transfer, we end up with a structure that looks like this. So it looks like we have a protonated alcohol on the structure here. Um, and so from this point, we now have a good leaving group. Specifically, water molecule. <clears throat> if we treat this as a good enough leaving group to just purely dissociate, which I'll show, the CO bond will break, the oxygen will gain electrons to become neutral, and that should actually give us a carbocation. So the OET group is still present, there'll be a positive charge on the carbon to which the oxygen is attached, and then we have a water molecule that's now free to float around. So normally we would think about these kinds of dissociations to make carbocations as being relatively unfavorable. Right? Carbocations generally are not particularly stabilized structures, but in this case it turns out it's surprisingly easy. This step to dissociate water is quite fast. I'd like for you to rationalize 
why water leaving to make this carbocation is so much faster than normal, so much faster than a typical carbocation being formed. So you've had a chance to think this over, and hopefully what you were thinking about is that this carbocation might be more stable than normal. If the carbocation is more stable, it will be easier for us to make it. Uh, and so if we actually look carefully at the structure, we notice that this oxygen has lone pairs that could be shared with the carbon that's positively charged. So this structure actually has uh, an important resonance contributor where there is a CO pi bond. In fact, this is the major resonance structure. So we have a resonance stabilized carbocation. And once again, that means that it should form more quickly than other carbocations that don't enjoy the same kind of stabilization. So once we get to this carbocation, we know we've got a very good electrophile. There's water present, which could actually associate to the carbon. That's going to give us the reverse reaction. But if we're running this reaction where we have ethanol present, then there'll be also additional ethyl, ethyl, ethanol molecules. So the other possibility here is that another molecule of ethanol can associate to this carbocation. So that will give me a new CO bond. And a new OAT group, but one of them has, still has a proton. So remember that this proton is not coming off in this step. The oxygen is bonding to the carbon. That's now going to give rise to a highly acidic proton, where if it dissociates, I'm not paying such a huge energetic tax. So it looks to me like the last thing that I've shown is formation of an acetal, where I have my two OET groups and a proton which is good because we're proposing that this reaction is acid catalyzed. I should get a proton back at some point. So we regenerate a proton. So cat catalytic. Excellent. Here's our acetal. And we can see that along the way we made water. So that's in the middle of the mechanism. So our products would be both the acetal and water. And this required some kind of a ketone, or this also works in the exact same fashion with aldehydes. And also two different molecules of the ethanol. Right, because we're going to incorporate two different equivalents of this ethanol into the final product. Since we've established the mechanism of acetal formation under acidic conditions, we can also start to make predictions about what kinds of products will form if we actually treat aldehydes or ketones like we saw in the previous example with alcohols and some source of an acid, usually a fairly strong acid, so in this case sulfuric acid. And we note that like, if the sulfuric acid weren't there, we might expect to see the formation of a hemiacetal, which we've talked about in previous videos. But this information that we actually have an acid present tells us that we're actually right, we're making an acetal. So acid indicates acetal formation in the presence of alcohols. And so the last thing that I would need to think about to actually draw a predicted product for these kinds of reactions would be, well, what does the acetal actually look like? And we know that that means the carbonyl is going to effectively disappear and be converted into something else. The benzene ring is still going to be present, so I still have a phenyl group, I still have this proton. The only thing that's changing is the electrophilic site. So I'll also label that so that we're clear. And then in the products, well, what is the electrophilic site? So E here is or what was the electrophilic site. There's my proton. And then if I'm making an acetal, I'm going to in introduce two ethers onto this carbon. So the last question is, well, what kind of ether? Isopropyl, ethyl, that's always going to be related to the alcohol. So if I have a methyl, 
a methyl alcohol or a methanol, I'm going to have methyl ethers. So I've got an OME group and then another OME group. So one thing that we need to be able to, to note then, I guess, is that this oxygen of the methanol, this is the nucleophilic site. So it makes sense to me that we're introducing this MEO group. The oxygen is what's being connected to the electrophilic carbon. And the acid catalysis basically tells us we can do that twice. First time we protonate this oxygen, that allows us to add the first uh, methoxy group very quickly to form the hemiacetal. And then we also can protonate the resulting alcohol in the hemiacetal to actually form a carbocation and introduce a second equivalent of methanol. That's what we actually did the mechanism to show. So we could expect to form products like this. Uh, we could look at other kinds of examples also. So we'll go to a different kind of a ketone. I'll just choose something simple like acetone. But let's look at a different kind of an alcohol. Uh, instead of like methanol or ethanol, let's look at a compound that we're going to call a diol, which has two different alcohol groups in it. So we'll choose a compound like this. This is ethylene glycol. If you've ever actually used antifreeze in anything, you use this compound. Uh, and again, we'll use an acid catalyst. I'm just going to change up my structure here. F, we could use HCl or other strong acids. Uh, we can denote this as proton catalyst. Uh, but I want to get sure, make sure that there's a variety of different permutations here in the video so you get comfortable with different kinds of things that you might see. Um, and so in this case, again, we can approach this in the same way. We see that there's an acid. We see that there's alcohol groups. So we're thinking, okay, some kind of an acetal. We can identify electrophilic sites as well as nucleophilic sites. But now with a the diol, there's actually two nucleophilic sites. So if we think about this from a mechanistic perspective, we know the first thing that happens is it will form an OC bond between the nucleophilic site and the electrophilic site. Our methyl groups are going to stay the same. So I can start to sketch a structure out. And then I need to think about well, what else would happen. So once I form a hemiacetal, where I've made this new CO bond, I know that I'm going to actually be able to protonate the resulting alcohol on the electrophilic carbon. And then I can actually attach the other OH group to the same carbon. So both of these oxygens end up bonded to this carbon. We end up with a structure that actually has a new ring in it. Looks a little bit like a person, right? Some eyeballs, maybe I can give it a little hair. Very nice, right? If you like punk, you know, this looks like Milo from The Descendants. Um, so we call these cyclic acetals. In part because they, what we're doing is forming a ring by connecting two different nucleophilic sites within the, from the same molecule to the same electrophilic atom. All right, so then we can look at another permutation here. Um, so we'll go back to our good friend cyclohexanone. And let's use HBR as our catalyst now. And a compound called neopental glycol. So again, it has some OH groups here two of them in the same structure. So now that we've seen this pattern in a couple of different cases, what I'd like for you to do is predict the structure of the product that will form, or the organic product that will form, when these compounds interact with cyclohexanone. So go ahead and pause your video and predict the structure of the product for this bottom reaction. So you've had a chance to actually predict the product here. Uh, we want to approach this in the same way we had in other cases involving acetals. We know that there's an acid, so we've got an acetal. And then we're going to start finding our sites. So we've got an electrophilic site here in the ketone, and then we've got a nucleophilic site. But I need to be careful. I'm also going to have a second nucleophilic site in the same structure. And that tells me something about the fact that I'm forming a cyclic acetal. So now what's left for me to do is to convert all of those individual small decisions about outcomes into a structure of the product where I know that the cyclohexane ring is going to stay the same. I'm actually going to turn this compound on its side because I have more space running horizontally here. So just to be clear, that electrophilic site I'm going to place here. It's like I've taken the ring and just turned it 90 degrees. And I know that I'm going to form a new CO bond. <coughs> 
and that, that oxygen is going to be attached to a CH2 group, a C group with a carbon with two different methyls. That same carbon is attached to another CH2. So you see how I'm just going back and forth where I'm not trying to just stare at this and rub my temples and like come up with an answer. I'm actually trying to kind of work systematically by identifying the bonds that are forming and then sketching and everything else attached to those individual atoms that are the kind of the locus of reactivity. So this CH2 group is attached to my other nucleophilic site, the oxygen, which I know also becomes attached to the electrophilic site by virtue of what acid catalysts allow us to do. So I end up with a structure that looks like this. Again, this is another form of a cyclic acetal. So just to be clear, cyclic acetal does not mean five-membered ring that looks like Milo from the Descendants. It's any time I'm making a new ring by forming these two new CO bonds. The ring can be many different sizes, so this is a different kind of a cyclic acetal. One thing you might be considering, if you've been thinking about the material in SLO7 uh, critically, which I would always encourage, is that it doesn't make sense that we should form these acetals. Like, oh yeah, cool, I can go synthesize acetals. We're probably, all of these reactions are reversible additions, and we establish that most of the time these are actually unfavorable. So how are we making acetals? Good question. To actually think about that process in more detail, I've given us an example. This is actually one of the, the syntheses that we looked at in the last section of this video, where we have uh, an aldehyde reacting with two molecules or two equivalents of methanol, and that's going to give us our acetal along with a molecule of water. And so if we actually do this reaction, we know that there's some acid catalyst that's needed, but that acid catalyst is on both the product side and the reactant side. That's what it means to be a catalyst. So I'm actually just going to write it above the equilibrium arrow, which basically is telling me it's on both sides. And we know that the acid catalyst accelerates both the forward and the reverse reaction. So acid, that's going to be an important concept for us. We'll give it the present tense. forward and reverse reactions. It doesn't change the position of equilibrium at all. So how is it that I'm actually going to make an acetal? If I look at these structures, I don't really know what the KEQ values are going to be, but like what I saw from previous videos is that like aldehydes tend to, unless they're weird, like chloral, they don't really tend to form hydrates in, in very large quantities. So we would need to think about it for whatever reason we wanted the acetal. How could we actually overcome the intrinsic placement of equilibrium here? And we know we've only got one tool in our tool belt ever to do this. That's to use Le Chatelier's principle. We need to actually drive or push this reaction to the product side. So we're going to use Le Chatelier's. principle to drive reaction in whatever direction we want to go. So you've known about Le Chatelier's principle for a while now, and we've invoked it several times over the course of the semester. What I would like for you to do, knowing that we're going to use Le Chatelier's principle to, to drive the reaction, Let's say we wanted to make an acetal. Maybe we were getting paid to actually like make this compound and then we're going to sell it to people or something. We want our yield to be as high as possible. That means we want to drive the reaction all the way to the right. I want you to propose two methods, right? Two methods where you could use Le Chatelier's principle to do that. So go ahead and pause your video, come up with your two methods for driving the reaction to the right. So you have two methods. Um, we know that Le Chatelier's principle basically states that we actually need to either pull material through the equilibrium by removing one of the products. If I look at the two compounds that are present, I don't know exactly how I'm going to be able to remove this compound, but maybe I could remove water. That might be kind of convenient. It's a little bit like a side product anyway. So one option would be to remove water. There are a few ways to do this. Um, if you think about when you work in an organic lab, you remove water from organic solvents at the very end of extractions. You use drying agents, and it turns out that those actually work to absorb water as it's forming in these kinds of reactions. So you can use drying agents. 
You could also, depending on the boiling point of this compound, you might be able to just heat the mixture up and actually boil the water off as the reaction goes. That'll be challenging though because of the presence of the methanol. So the other option here is that we could actually add an excess of reactants and that will push the reaction to the right. So again, if I'm thinking about what's more likely to be my limiting reagent, this compound maybe I guess, probably limiting reagent, it seems more complicated than methanol. Methanol could be a solvent for us. So we'll actually typically do this, use very large amounts of methanol um, to actually push the reaction forward. And actually we use both of these strategies at the same time. So we typically will add, use the alcohol as a solvent for the reaction. So many, many, many equivalents of it. And we'll also remove water as it forms. So we're both pushing and pulling. So we'll add an excess of alcohol. And often do we do both. Note that Le Chatelier's principle just tells us what will actually happen in terms of what kinds of compounds will exist over the course of the reaction. It doesn't tell us about rate. So we're doing two different things here. We're accelerating both forward and backward reactions with the catalyst, and then we're actually using Le Chatelier's principle to select what we want to isolate at the end, whether we mostly want product or reactant. So that brings me to the last question that I have for you in this section of the video. Let's say for whatever reason you wanted to run the reaction backwards. Maybe you had an acetal and you actually wanted to recover an aldehyde from the acetal. I want you to actually propose a set of reaction conditions. So what would you add to the flask to actually convert an acetal into an aldehyde? So you've come up with a proposal for this transformation where we're going to go from an acetal back to the corresponding ketone or aldehyde. I know which one it is based on the presence of this proton on a carbon that's sandwiched between my two ethers. So I can trace the essentially like acetal carbon, I guess, to, to my carbonyl. Um, and so what we're going to do is actually call it an acetal hydrolysis. You probably noticed that if I wanted to run the reaction that we had on the previous board backwards, I need to have both the acetal but also water. So one of the reagents I'm going to introduce here is water itself. Probably I'll want to use a large amount of this. I still have this problem where I need to use Le Chatelier's principle to drive a reaction one direction or the other. And so this water molecule ends up being split apart into a bunch of different pieces. The oxygen from the water ends up being incorporated into the aldehyde, and the two methoxy groups end up turning into methanol molecules, but with the protons that they're getting from water. Okay, so and I'm going to make two of these. The other thing that I needed to deal with is rate. So it's not, it's, it's not enough just to have the two reagents that I need to drive the reaction backwards or to hydrolyze the acetal or to use a bunch of water to like use Le Chatelier's principle to drive the reaction that way. I still need an acid catalyst. I need to make this reaction at a reasonable rate, especially now that if I look at this structure as written, I don't see any electrophilic sites. I need to protonate one of these oxygens in order to actually start the process of like Protonate the oxygen, make the good leaving group, have it leave, make the carbocation, and then water can get involved. So I also need some kind of an acid catalyst. For this, I'm going to leave it generic. Right? You, again, you could choose sulfuric acid, HCl, HBr, whatever, right? but you definitely need a strong acid for this. So let's look at a couple of examples of acetal hydrolysis. You've got one here now. We could also look at ketones. Um, so we could look at maybe the ethyl acetal of cyclopentanone and react these with both water and an acid catalyst. And so again, what I'm going to think about is tracing the carbon that I'm calling the acetal carbon. Here I've got two different CC bonds from that point, so I know I must be generating a ketone. Um, still going to have the five-membered ring. And then the place where these two OET groups was replaced, I'll end up with a carbonyl. So that's essentially the transformation. Typically, when we run these reactions, we're interested in isolating the carbonyl piece, although that's not universally true. So it's, I guess, of a little bit lesser importance to write out the alcohol products as well. So finally, we can look at a case where we actually take like a cyclic acetal and do the same kind of reaction. So we'll use this particular one. Reagents don't change here. I need water, and I need a lot of it, and I'm going to need an acid catalyst. 
and it'll play the same game. So I'm looking for the acetyl carbon, it's here. Note that this carbon has a proton. It was implied, but I'll draw it in. So that means I know that I'm making an aldehyde, and I'm making an aldehyde at this carbon. That means the benzene ring is not changing, the chlorine is not changing, and then all of this stuff, so oxygen, carbon, 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 oxygen, all of that is coming off of the molecule. So I can go ahead and draw the structure that I essentially decided on, like so. It's not a great H. Make it a little clearer. We'll want to trace that acetyl carbon back to the carbonyl. That looks good. And then finally, in this case, just to be clear, uh, we're going to end up with a single molecule of alcohol, but it'll be a diol, right? So we're going to break both this CO and that CO bond and make a diol with a three-carbon spacer. So we'll end up with a structure like that. So these are some examples of acetyl hydrolysis reactions. You can see they look exactly like acetyl formation, but run in reverse because that's exactly what they are. There's no strong thermodynamic preference for one side or the other, and so depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you'll use Le Chatelier's principle to drive these reactions either toward hydrolysis or toward acetyl formation itself. So that's conclude this concludes our video about acetals, and the next video we'll be looking at a wrinkle that's substantially similar but involves nitrogen nucleophiles instead of alcohols.